lift up your hands tonight and let's worship the Lord. If you love the Lord, just worship him. Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. There is no two way about it. And we want to live for you. We want to glorify you with our lives. Father, we thank you. We honor you. So much to me. I love you, Lord. loud hallelujah father we ask oh god that you breathe upon the immutability of your counsel tonight minister to us give us a word in season and may your name be glorified in jesus name we have prayed please you may be comfortably seated hallelujah i want to welcome you to this pre-convention uh marriage breakthrough seminar um marriage marriage and singles breakthrough seminar yeah ict marriage and singles breakthrough seminar praise the lord hallelujah we're going to be as brief and as fast as we can be today god's servant is around he's in the office uh you'll join us soon so don't be distracted by that um he's part of us and he's watching us you know the way god is watching us from heaven <laughs> praise god hallelujah very quickly we want to look tonight as uh, um in this mar marriage and singles uh breakthrough seminar uh, at the start of this convention uh the convention uh, of 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 royal priesthood um we want to look at the topic the royal priesthood and marital distinction the royal priesthood and marital distinction today i'll be starting with the singles and we want to see what are the criteria what are so, so, uh, some vital things that we need to take note of as singles before we get married somebody would probably say this woman is always talking about this is she not tired no i can't be tired until the situations around the young people around us is arrested so tonight we want to look at purity as foundation for marital establishment as a royal priesthood purity as a foundation for marital establishment as a royal priesthood Our anchor scriptures we'll look at today is Esther chapter 2. We'll read verse 2, we'll read verse 5 and all the way to 9. And then we'll read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. And then we'll read Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Matthew, uh, Esther chapter 2 from verse 2, it says, Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemel, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. Probably they had been slain at the war, and she was left as an orphan. So he brought her up. And the maid was what? Fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when, his father, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Hagar, and that, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Hagar, the keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things that belonged to her. And seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house and he preferred her and her maidens unto the best place of the house 
of the women. Praise the Lord. I'll stop there. Okay, let's, let's read the next one. Let's just go ahead. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, which is our second scripture, says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, if it's a Bible, a hard copy, underline it. If it's, um, if it's a soft copy on, 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 your, on your phone or your iPad, and you can singly uh, 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 underline a word. So go ahead and under, underline the word fornication there. Let me take it again. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away, underline wife, whosoever shall put away his wife, underline it, saving for the cause of fornication. Now underline that fornication. Caused her to commit adultery, underline adultery. We stop there. Praise the Lord. And then Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. It says, marriage is honorable in all, the bed undefiled. But warmongers and adulterers, God will judge. So you can underline the word also warmongers, and you can underline the word adulterers. Praise the Lord. Now, as pastors, can we have family meeting? Let's talk heart to heart. As pastors, many times, many times, in fact, it's every day. People walk up to us and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm trusting God to be married. Nothing is working. I've been in many, many relationships, and they all didn't work. Another day, another person comes up. This is my seventh engagement that just broke, and she's crying. Sometimes they come, different conditions and different stories. And then, after a while, having done a series of investigations, when... I meet young ladies like that and some young men like that I ask them how long was this courtship they could tell you or when last were you in courtship they could tell you and then you ask did you people sleep with each other in the course of this courtship it's more, basically 99% for those who are honest they say yes they did even on Tuesday, here, somebody met me. She said, this is her seventh relationship. It just broke up. When it gets to the time of going to see their parents, or if, in fact, sometimes they've seen their parents, and so on and so forth, then it breaks. And I said, excuse me, all these seven people, did you have immorality with them? And she, she bent her head and said, yes. So I told her, that is why. It doesn't matter the demons, the ancestral forces that are fighting you. They have no ability to stop you from getting married when somebody has come when the bed has not been defiled. Why do I say so? Some people might take me up on this on social media. I really can't, I can't be bothered. I'm telling you what I've seen from scriptures and what we've seen over the years. Talking, interacting with people, praying with people, crying for some. There was this case... Just very recently, mature lady, mature lady. We've prayed with her, counseled with her, talked with her, and then bam, she came very excited, happy, celebrating. Somebody has come, a gentleman that is equal of age to her age. She was so excited, and I was so excited. And I prayed for her again, thanking God. And then two months later, she comes crying eyes red and swollen bloodshot i said what happened she said the relationship just broke up i put my head down and said what happened did you sleep with each other she kept her head down and said yes i said why you have waited all this why 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 now what is the principle i first of all learned about this many years ago this was still while we were in the university and it was God's servant that preached and talked about this passage in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 32 where it says, thou shalt not put away your wife except on the ground of fornication thereby causing her to commit adultery. What does this mean? In the Jewish tradition 
when a man and a woman have become engaged to be married, the Jewish tradition recognizes them that these ones are about to become a couple. They are about to become husband and wife. And what happens is that they begin to accord the lady the privileges, the rights, the honor, the respect that is accorded to a married woman. So if they come into a place, into a gathering or something like that, and um, maybe somebody needs to give up a seat for somebody like a, a mature married woman, she would qualify because she's already engaged. But any act of immorality that takes place between this engaged couple is still viewed as what? Fornication. But when it happens between people who are already married, it's called adultery. And so in that place, it seems like God, Jesus was telling the disciples that were asking him this question, and he was talking to them that God seems to be able to hold and protect and preserve a relationship while in courtship, while in engagement, and helps them to successfully carry this relationship to termination in marriage when the bed is undefiled. However, when it has become defiled, he could hands off and just put his hands on his back and just stand and watch. So the kind of storms that that um, proposed engaged couples could encounter and they stand their ground and they're able to carry it through to the end, it becomes a bit, you know, they, are not, they don't have enough backing to fight that resistance. Are you understanding my, what I'm saying? So the first thing that happens, let me put it this way, is number one, God God does not fight for the success of such an engagement. The number two thing that happens is that the couple are blinded by the immorality that takes place between them and they cannot see the flaws in the partners. And so they are not able to see that this man is inherently selfish or this girl is very rude and insubordinating. They cannot see that this woman is not going to be able to respect her husband when she gets married or that this man is not going to provide for the woman when they get married because something is clouding their eyes. The immorality becomes like a sunglasses or like a coat on their eyes and they cannot see the real nature of the person they are entering into relationship with. The third thing that happens is that there is a breakdown in mutual respect. Number four is there is a breakdown in mutual love. Number five there is a breakdown in mutual trust. And number six, the likelihood of such an engagement breaking up is very high. When, however, maybe the people insist and they go ahead and get married, it usually gives rise to a very turbulent marital relationship. Because where there is no love, where there's no respect, where there's no trust, it becomes a challenge. The woman goes out, the man asks, where have you been? She went to do her hair. How long does it take to do hair? I've heard of a case of a woman that had to give her phone to the woman selling tomatoes in the market to convince the man that she was in the market selling tomatoes. Where there is no trust, there is no love, and there is no respect, such a relationship is endangered for disaster. And so royal priesthoodship and, and, uh, requires that purity is the bedrock of marital relationship. 
the priests needed to consecrate themselves in the Old Testament before they came before the Lord. There was a need for a whole lot of purity, a whole lot of sanctification, a whole lot of integrity as far as priesthood was concerned. Let me say one more point and then we'll move on to the, to the, to the couples. I realize that there is a pandemic in our nation, in our world today. We're in a, we're in a, we're in a pandemic where marital values have degenerated. I got to learn recently that the new norm or the new way they do it is that people are first friends, a boy and a girl. They are first friends. Then the stage two, they confess to each other. I said, confess what? It's called they are confessing their love to each other. So there is a day, a particular day, they say, I love you, and the man says, I love you. I'll be the other way around. So that is stage two. After stage two, that they have confessed to each other, their love for each other, then they start what they call dating. Dating is stage three. Am I right? Where are the Gen Z people? Is that the sequence or not? No, tell me, oh, because maybe I was misinformed. Then they start the next stage, stage three, which is dating. In dating stage now, it depends on the level of laxity and permissiveness of the couple, but they can start doing a, a few things here and there. Then they move to stage four, which is engagement. Now, I realize that what is very rampant now is people can remain on the engagement stage for as long as nine years, 10 years, 11 years. Am I right? Call the name of some of those your popular artists. How long were they in a courtship, in engagement? Then, after that stage five, they go for, for court registry. Some do the court registry and then do wedding at the same time, or they still have a gap between the court registry and the marriage. But from the stage of dating, engagement, and court registry, they have done something in their own mind that they have formalized and they start living together. Many of the, many of the popular, popular people that many young people are following, are uh, exemplarizing their lives after them and all that are in those kind of process of relationship. And guess what? How many of you have noticed that that engagement that they can have for nine years, 10 years, 11 years, immediately they now do that they have done the wedding, the marriage breaks up in two weeks. Am I correct? Can you call some? No, don't call Nemo. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But it is so rampant. It has existed in the Western world for years. And unfortunately for us in Africa and in Nigeria, we have started to imbibe it. Beloved, the process is you, are in, you, you, you identify who you want to be in relationship with. Even if you are friends, the bed remains undefiled. Whatever processes you are going through, even when you say we are getting engaged, you have met your parents, you met everybody, the bed remains undefiled. When you have gone to your parents and you have done your traditional marriage, you have paid dowry, you have done all that needs to be done traditionally, the bed remains undefiled, except you plan to end your marriage at traditional marriage. And since you are not going to end it at traditional marriage, the bed remains undefiled. For us as a church here, what we establish is that the traditional marriage, the court registry, and the church marriage is done maximum in one week. At the longest in two weeks. Some is done over one weekend. Thursday court, Friday traditional, Saturday sun, um, church, court, church marriage. Why? So that there's no temptation. We're already legally married from the court. 
but you have not yet been blessed in the church. The consequences we see that happen in the lives of people who are sleeping with each other for years before they got married, many times we see it in those who went ahead even after the traditional marriage. I beg to differ, but the issue is what we have seen practically and what we have confirmed from people that have come time and time again to be prayed for. There is no hurry. Young people, there is no rush. Don't say we are dating. In fact, if I were you, so that I don't get confused, remove the vocabulary dating. We are in relationship, planning to get married. When is it going to happen? It cannot exceed one year from when we met and we decided. So that you are not prolonging things. And you tell yourself, within that one year, I will keep myself. I will hold myself. I will control myself. After all, it's one year. Now it's 11 months. Now it's 10 months. Now it's uh, 9 months. Now it's uh, 7 months. Now it's 6 months. You can easily do that. And then we also advise people, as soon as you have decided you are going to get married, let the church marriage committee be aware of your plans so that they too can help to keep an eye on you. You know, in the 70s, the 80s, when people were in courtship, they used to meet in the pastor's house. Nobody's going to do that to you now. That's extreme. We expect that you have personal self-control. I'm saying this out of passion because of cases, even in this week, that one has had to solve, one has to, had to work on, one has had to um, and pray for and encourage and console and, and, and see people going in pains. You shall never suffer such in the name of Jesus Christ. So, remember this, that purity is the key. Purity is the key. The one qualification that was used for Queen Esther was purity. Yes, the Bible described her as fair, she was beautiful, and every other thing was described, but the qualification that was asked for by the chamberlains, by the king's um, authorities in the selection of the wife that was fit for royalty was purity. You shall not miss it in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are, if you are single again, I want to prophesy to you that somebody is coming for you in the name of Jesus. And this time, when this person comes, you ensure that you follow the procedures of maintaining absolute integrity in the name of Jesus. Now, let's quickly look at, um, at let's quickly look at, at, at married couples. If you look at Esther chapter 1, Esther chapter 1, verse 3, verse 4, verse 9, verse 11, and verse 12. Esther chapter 1, verse 3. It says, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto his princes and his servants, and the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. Verse 4, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his majesty, many days, even an hundred and four score days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And then... Then verse 9, also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Verse 11, the king commanded for 11, the king commanded to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princess her beauty for she was fair to look upon. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burnt within him. Praise the Lord. The only factor we'll look at today in this um, 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 marital dignity and distinction as royal priesthood is marital unity and oneness. For us to achieve distinction and 
greatness in marriage as a couple we need unity we need oneness this story that we read about the king Ahasuerus and the queen Vashti shows that for 180 days the king was doing a celebration there was a whole party that had been going on day after day after day for 180 days and then a final party that had taken place right within the palace of the king in the garden right in the palace uh, premises for another seven days and all this while the queen had not been involved the queen was not carried along the queen didn't know who the guests were she didn't have anything to do with them then suddenly after one run 87 days the king now stands up and said bring the queen let her display her beauty she should make sure she wears the royal crown you know the royal crown is heavy gold with plenty diamonds and studs so that they can also see how heavy the queen's crown was and the woman refused all I can imagine is that she must have said, is she just a wallpaper? Is she just a picture hanging on the wall in the house? She doesn't know anything about what's going on. Is it just to display her beauty to the world that she exists for? It wasn't difficult for her to refuse. Well, that's another message or we are going to talk about insubordination and, and disobedience to husband and all that. So, but today I'm not making an excuse for her as it were. So just bear that in mind. But it is easier when people understand and are together in a project for there to be maximum cooperation on all the stages of the project. Uh, yeah, you can clap if you want. In many homes, the woman is doing her own thing. You saw what we just read in verse 11. And Vashti the queen, what did she do? She started having her own party for the women. That's 11, verse 9. 9. She started having a party for herself, for the women. See? And also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. We don't have time to break this scripture. But let me just drop something here. In her insubordination and her doing her own thing, she was doing it in the royal house that belonged to who? That belonged to the king. And so, if she's in that royal house belonging to the king, she ought to be able to do whatever she's doing with the consent, the approval, and the cooperation of the king. And at the same time, what the king is doing should be done together. He doesn't need her approval, but it is just, it's just, it's just, um, it's just, um, it's just uh, good to be together on the same page. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. The, the, the man is the head of the home. The woman is to submit herself unto her own husband. And as the head, uh, the head turning in one direction to, should determine the turning also of the whole body in the same direction with the king. But when the head is moving discoordinatedly from the rest of the body, there is schisms in the system. Let's look at two, um, three examples from scripture. The first example, number one, is the example of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. I first heard this illustration from God's servant. Now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 18. Genesis 2, 16 to 18. He says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And then God made man. And then in chapter 3, verse 1 to 4. He says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea. Did God really, really, really say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, eh, unto the serpent, yes, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of trees of the garden, but of the tree of 
of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the Lord said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. And the story continues. The serpent came with subtlety. He came with 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 deceit and he came and he came to the woman and trying to convince the woman to eat of the tree that god had forbidden them now listen to this you remember the serpent had been created then god gave the man adam the instruction about what to do and what not to do the serpent might have overheard the conversation but the woman had not yet been created so she didn't know the instruction that god gave to the man all that was required of the man was to walk in unity with the wife and take her along on what he had been instructed before she came into his life. A, um, a, a, a point I'd like to make here is, from what I heard God's servant said, how would the servant have been able to have the opportunity to talk to the woman if Adam was standing by her side. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There was vacancy for Satan to engage the woman in conversation because her head was not around in a protective role to be part of her day. Many of you have heard God's servant preach it before, but in this light, I want you to understand it. Man, Woman, your togetherness is vital. You're starting a business venture. You are not, it's not that you are taking permission from your wife, but what do, what, let's discuss it. How do you see this? Women can have sensitivity. They can pray. How many of you have heard stories of women that told their husband, this is your friend, I don't like him. I, and the man will say, eh, why, what did he do? And you know, many times women don't have one plus one that will be equal to two, but they can originate three out of what they see. <laughs> From some sixth sense somewhere. So number, the eighth thing we want to notice is that the serpent would not have had the opportunity to talk to Eve is if Adam was present. B, even if the serpent had the boldness and the audacity to now come and talk to the woman when Adam was present, the Adam, the man who God gave the original instruction would have been able to correct the serpent's erotic, ironic information he would have been able to tell him that god didn't say you will die you know that's what the devil capitalized on the woman you know how women are she had that jarra into what her husband told her the husband told her a bit but she added her own so the thing she added was the one the devil used to knock out the arguments this was some kind of a court of law not some courts that i know of but she said, God said it's true that we shouldn't eat it and that if we touch it, that if we touch it, we will die. Then the serpent said, no, number one, you won't die. And it's not a matter of touch. It's just if, if you eat it, even if you eat it, you won't die. So she said, hey, is that so? And she started listening to him to carry out this, 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 this satanic um, instruction. Number C. Many men have made investments, decisions that failed because they didn't work together as a couple. And number D, share your consecrations. Husband and wife, share your consecrations that you had made with God before you got married. For me, I think that this tree uh, issue was like a consecration that Adam made between him and God 
said, don't do this, don't do this, and Adam said, yes, sir. When he got married, he should have had time to share. This is my consecration. I have vowed that I will do this. I have vowed that I will do that. Some people don't even know their husband's kingdom financial practices. They don't know how he pays his tithe or how he gives. They don't know any of the things that he does. Beloved, you must be able to work together in unity as a couple for you to be able to succeed. Let me drop a word for women. Never misuse information that your husband gives you against him and vice versa some people take information about some errors of the man or the woman from the past and they use it against them in times of challenges in their life and in their marital destiny sometimes it prevents the man from talking anything further with the women ensure that you are not a victim of that in the name of Jesus I have a few more minutes number two is um, Number second reference is the reference of Samson. When um, Samson in Judges chapter 15 and verse 4, Judges 15, 4, it says, And Samson went and caught 300 foxes. And he took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he set them to go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and the olives. Then the Philistines said, who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the of, Timni, of the Timnite because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion, blah, 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 and, and so on and so forth. Praise the Lord. Samson could have easily sent one fox but one fox with fire touch on his tail could have easily quenched the fire all he needed to do you know how dogs wag their tails all the, that the fox needed to do was with the fire burning on the tail he would hit the fire on the ground and the touch would do what? it will quench the fire will be um, put out but he took them two by two side by side and then at their tail at the back he puts the torch in between the two tails they had no option but to run they had no option but to go forward they had no option but to go in the same direction they ran in the same direction on fire and ran into the camp of the enemy and set the enemy's camp on fire. I want to announce to you today as royal priesthoods, when you leave this convention with your wife, with your husband, you shall run in unison on fire of the Holy Ghost to set the camp of the enemy on fire in the name of Jesus. The eighth thing we, need, we see there. It's what I just said, that instead of setting one torch on fire, he set the two because it gave a greater impact. Number B, the two foxes gave a bigger devastation to the enemy's fields. Because they were together, the devastation, the destruction was more. Number C, the two foxes by their effect, were able to draw the attention of the Philistines. And number D, because they were together, they had speed in running. They were able to run faster. They ran, accelerated, assisting each other, and went into the field. What's our conclusion there? If you desire speed in life, you desire greater impact in life and in ministry and in your destiny then a united family is the key praise the lord and the third and final reference is the reference in amos chapter 3 verse 3 amos 3 3 says can two walk together except they be agreed it's a question which you can easily answer by saying that two cannot walk together except they agree The two there from the original um, Hebrew translation refers to a couple. 
It also refers to a cardinal number. So two is a cardinal number. It's a vital number. It's a number of importance and relevance. And it shows us the power of two. Scripture tells us that one shall put a thousand to flight and two shall put ten thousand to flight. There's a multiplier effect when two are together. Number B, this walk of the journey of life is more productive when two walk together. The Hebrew translation of the word there talks about growth. That walk in that passage it talks about growth. When two walk together, growth is easier. Growth is faster. That word also talks of prosperity. When a couple walks together, prosperity is easier. Talks of prosperity. The word together there also talks about spreading you want your influence to spread walk in unity and also it talks about progress working together as a couple gives you progress and then see your working together in unity should be such that you become alike you are one. The word there, agree, talks about oneness. It talks about a likeness. A likeness in reasoning, mental functioning, a likeness even in facial appearance. How many of you have seen a couple that have been married for seven, several years? What happens? They begin to, they kind of look alike. Have you ever noticed that? There's, there's, a, there's a physiology and a biochemistry to it, but this is not such a class. But it happens, there's scientific evidence that proves it, and even in mannerisms. The other, the, um, the other day, um, there was a video clip um, that was shown to me, my children showed to me, and the same word I used, they said, that is exactly what daddy said when we showed him. Many times people leave senior pastor's office, come to my office, and I say the same thing. Or they say, oh, that's what senior pastor said. Oh, that's what he told us. This and that and that. Because we've been together for a couple of years and begin to think in similar manners. Because of unity, it helps you to know what next to do. You can take actions and take decisions quickly without missing the point today i want to announce to you that god is about to give you the place of royalty and royal priesthood in your marital distinction in the name of jesus christ Please stand up on your feet as we pray this evening i'd like to ask god father Please help me in my relationships, whatever it takes. These are very hard words I've heard this evening. Help me to do what I need to do so that I can walk in the reality of being a royal priesthood. Talk to God tonight. Talk to God this evening. Help me, oh God. Don't be a woman that is hiding money under the bed. Did I ever tell you the story of the woman who... The story of the woman who... She fell sick. And um, the, the man was looking for money to treat her. She had to have some kind of oppression or something like that. And um, the man had cleared all the money he had in the account and everything. And then he now decided, out of his love for his dear wife, he decided to sell his car, the only car he had, so that he would use the money for her treatment in the hospital. So... He was rushing out of the house to go sell the car, and his car key fell down by the side of the bed. So he bent down, the, the key fell and like rolled under the bed. So he bent down to pick the car key and saw bundles of money under the bed. 
bundles of money on the bed. He said, what is this? He checked it. Then he lifted the mattress and saw bulging, bulging portions of the mattress. The mattress was bulging with money that the wife has put aside. Maybe market money, food money, or whatever money. She had collected his money, packaged the money, and put inside the mattress and under the bed. So he brought them out, brought out the mattress, tore the, um, the, the cover of the mattress, and brought out all the money. Then he called his children, come, let's carry this mattress out. And then they set the mattress on fire. He used that money and went and paid her hospital bill. She got out of the hospital well, alive and well. He bought a new bed. So that it's very obvious when she enters the room and put the new bed with the new mattress. And then when she entered the house, she entered the room, said, where is the bed? Where is the mattress? The husband said, ah. He's very old. We are very happy to have you back from the hospital. So, we don't want you to come and sleep on old bed and old mattress. So, me and the children set, set the mattress on fire. on fire. Come and see where we bounce the mattress. The woman fainted. She has been fainting every day. <laughs> when she faints, the husband says, What happened? Are you still sick? Let's go to us. She said, No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking. She kept on fainting. Because she knows the money that was in that mattress and she thought the husband burnt it and she cannot tell him the truth because she has been stealing his money. May you not be such a deceptive and ununited wife in the name of Jesus Christ.